I'm Nicola Cornick and I love the Tudors Dynasty podcast. This is the Tudors Dynasty podcast. And now, Rebecca Larson. Welcome to episode 109. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. On today's show, we have some really fun topics to discuss. First, I welcome back my good friend and historian, Heather R. Darcy, to chat about Juana of Castile. On Ask the Expert, we have author Tony Riches on to answer your questions on Charles Brandon. Lastly, I give you a brief history on two Elizabeths who experienced domestic violence in Tudor England and how they survived it. Before we get started, a quick shout out to my newest patrons, Emily M. and Allison M. And of course, a huge thank you to all of my existing patrons. If you'd like to become a patron, you can now do so in two places, either Patreon or Podbean. Same great benefits, but two different places for those who ask for a different option. And now I've added a few new benefits as well. So if you're a current patron, be on the lookout in the near future for gifts in your email inbox. Oh, and I almost forgot. March patrons will receive an ebook copy of Tony Rich's book on Charles Brandon. So stay tuned for more information on that. This episode is once again so jam-packed full of information that I'm going to skip over most of what I usually say here. So I'll just leave you with this. Please follow me on social media for all kinds of fun information and chats. You can find me everywhere as at Tudors Dynasty. If you're on Facebook, please join my Tudors Dynasty podcast Facebook group. Also, subscribe and follow wherever you're listening to this episode. If you would be so kind to leave a friendly review, I will be ever grateful to you because it's those things that help this show get noticed by other Tudor lovers who may not know about it. All right, let's get on with the show. Heather, welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's good to be back. I'm so excited to have you back today to talk about Juana of Castile. So let's get started from the beginning. Who were her parents? Isabella and Ferdinand, the Catholic monarchs. And most of us, other than her parents, will know her as the sister of what famous queen consort of England? Catherine of Aragon. She was her older sister. Juana was older than Catherine. So the one thing when we talk about royal history is it always seems like all the family trees are intertwined a little bit. And I had mentioned to you the other day, and I had also posted it on my Tudor's Dynasty Facebook group, um, that I had found this um, series on Amazon Prime. I think it was a, a Star's original. And the mini series was about Maximilian I, which I honestly felt like I didn't really know a whole lot about him. So I thought this would be a fun way to kind of get a brief introduction. So I ended up binge watching the entire series in a day. I think it was like six episodes and they were each 45 minutes long. You know, I clearly I had not very much going on that day. <laughs> and so later that evening, it suddenly struck me about how all of these people were connected. So I want to kind of connect the dots for everybody. And if you can kind of help me along, if I mess up anywhere, Maximilian was married to Mary of Burgundy. Yes. They had a son called Philip, and we're going to know him as either Philip the Handsome or Philip the Fair. Yes. Okay. Now, here's where the trees kind of get connected a little bit to the history that we know as the Tudors, maybe. Who was Philip the Handsome or Fair married to? He married Juana of Castile. Okay, so now we have the son of Maximilian and the daughter of the Spanish monarchs. Is that correct? Yes. And fun fact, I believe they were all descended from John I of Portugal. I don't so they know. They were all related. Hmm. What's significant about him? I don't know anything about him. To be honest, I don't know a whole lot about him either, but it's just... I kind of wonder where that famous Habsburg jaw came from because it's very obvious in portraiture that Maximilian the first had it. And then Charles V really, really had it. I'm not sure. It doesn't appear that Philip had any type of issues with his jaw, but I'm kind of wondering where that came in, if it came in on the Habsburg side or not. But given that so many people were related to the Portuguese house, I'm wondering if it sneaked in over there possibly, or if that further complicated the genetic soup 
of the Habsburgs that became such an issue later on. A little bit of inbreeding. Yeah, yeah. Um, Juana was descended from John the First as well. And then we had Philip's sister, Margaret, also uh, obviously also the child of Maximilian and Mary of Burgundy, who yes. then married Juana's brother Juan. Yes, yes. So there was a dual marriage that took place. Nobody liked the French at that time. By nobody, I mean Isabella and Ferdinand. So it was they were trying to have some sort of unity against the French monarchs and. Maximilian was also looking for the same sort of setup, so it worked out for them. Unfortunately, Juan died fairly young, fairly quickly after the marriage with Margaret, and I believe that her only child with him was stillborn. I believe it was a stillborn daughter, a daughter that died shortly after birth, and so there was no heir from Juan. In the interim, Juana's other siblings and their children all passed away, and so it, by the time Isabella and later on Ferdinand passed away, it was really just Juana and Catherine that were left. Let's talk some more about Juana and Philip. What, yeah. what was the benefit of their marriage? Consolidating power against the French and also having allies in the northeastern part of Europe so that they could kind of, you know, you have the Iberian Peninsula to the southwest of France, and then you have the Low Countries, and of course the Habsburg lands to the east of France, so they could kind of keep keep it in check, and also trade negotiations between their different port cities. Yep, that's my answer. Uh, <laughs> also, well, also on the off chance that one Margaret's husband did die, and there were no other heirs, then there was the possibility that Philip could become King of Castile and Leon, and eventually King of Aragon as well. Jure Exoris, which means by the right of his wife, Juana. Was the marriage of Juana and Philip a love match? You know, it's odd that way. From what I've seen, there, there are accounts of her becoming very emotionally violent, I suppose you could say. And at one point, she did physically attack one of Philip's mistresses. We have to keep in mind that she was not quite 17 when they married, and he was about 18. And tempering this with the idea that it is very dangerous to diagnose anyone from history with a mental illness or a medical issue or really be able to categorize their relationships from the little bits and snatches that we get that trickle down through the sands of time. It kind of seems like there was a lot of emotional abuse maybe by Philip and he would lock her up occasionally and they'd have these great rows. And the other thing we have to remember too, is that between her first pregnancy that we're aware of, which resulted in the birth of Eleanor, the oldest child, she was pregnant for 54 out of 107 months of her life. Wow. So between February of 1498 and January of 1507, she was pregnant for more than half of that time. So, she, And then, of course, you have her recovering from childbirth and all the things that go along with that. And at the same time, her husband's screwing around behind her back and her dad's trying to steal her kingdom. It was, I can't imagine that would have been easy for anybody. And Philip regarded their children as his children. They were his property. Charles was his son, not their son. Do you see what I'm saying? It's interesting that you bring that up because that's kind of a topic that we touch base on in the next or in the last segment of the podcast today is about um, basically men owning their wives and children and um, how they can basically get away with anything because the laws were not friendly to women. And I think that they were more friendly to women in Castile and Leon. So there had been a history of female monarchs, Queen's Regnant and Castile and Leon, but around the time of Isabella's death, I believe she died in 1504, I want to say right around 1504 or 1505, Ferdinand was actively trying to reform inheritance laws in Aragon and as much as he could in Castile as well to try and change the course of who could inherit what and kind of cut out women from what I can tell. So there was definitely almost a partnership, I suppose you could say, between Ferdinand and Philip, or at least their minds were on the same wavelength as far as cutting out the women in their lives. Wow. Like, I was, you know, I've always been curious why, you know, Isabel of Castile ruled on her own. Was that normal for the time or was, was England behind 
um, just behind Europe in general? Do you have any thoughts on how that kind of all worked out? I do. Um, so in England, it wasn't so much that they were behind, it's that there was no precedent for it. So the only other time that there was a woman available to be ruler of England was the Empress Matilda, and I believe she was in the 12th century, and her brother or cousin, no, it wouldn't have been her brother, her cousin Stephen wound up taking the throne from her, but that was the last time in England before Mary I that we really had a chance for there to be a queen regnant of England. It just didn't come up. It just wasn't a problem. As far as France goes, it's a bit disputed. For a long time, there was this belief that under Salic law that women couldn't inherit. It's been exposed through scholarly debate, I suppose you could say, that the law upon which they relied was not a, was a forgery. So fun little fact there. But yeah, I wouldn't say that England was behind. I would just say that they hadn't had the opportunity. And then, of course, if you go to the Holy Roman Empire, specifically to the German portions, women just couldn't inherit territory there the same way that women could in England or especially in Castile and Leon. If we look at, just to mention her, because I always... I find I always wind up mentioning her, like Anna of Cleves, her mother, Maria of, of Eulichenberg was a hereditary duchess of Eulichenberg. She couldn't rule the lands on her own, but, or she couldn't hold it by herself, but her husband, Johann, Anna's father, when he married her, he took over the property, property by right of the marriage. And then it became descendable or divisible to their offspring. But I don't think that England was behind so much as they just didn't have an opportunity. And no one really knew what would happen if a woman became Queen Regnant of England. Now, speaking of England, later on in the reign of Henry VII, Juana and her husband Philip, um, what's the best way to say it, had a stop in England due to weather. <laughs> yes, they shipwrecked. That's very eloquent. They had a, they had a little... Stop over in England. Um, yeah, they were on their way to Spain so that Juana could take control of her territory. Where had they been? In Flanders, or for, that might be a little too specific. They were in the Low Countries. I think they might have been Mechelm, I'm not sure, but they were in his territory, basically. So modern-day Belgium and the Netherlands is what's meant by the Low Countries. Okay. And I know you're you're always doing research on Catherine of Aragon as well. So during that time that they were uh, on their layover, let's call it when they were on their okay. layover in England, did Juana and Catherine get to see each other? I have to tell you, I haven't looked at that specifically, but I'm under the impression that they did and that they were entertained by Catherine and I believe Prince Henry, because he was not Henry VIII yet at Windsor Castle. Yeah, I, re I specifically remember a story where um, young Henry, before he be obviously became Henry VIII, was just enamored with Philip that later on when he heard of Philip's death, he was just beside himself with grief and had made a comment in a letter to, I think it was Erasmus, saying that he had um, it had brought back the pain of lo losing his own mother. So oh, wow. he had felt this connection with Philip. And I've always been curious by that. Was it, you know, was it because Philip was a good looking guy, charismatic? You know, I just, it's fascinating to me that young Henry was, was so awestruck with him is maybe the best way to say it. You know, I wonder if he might have seen a bit of Arthur in Philip. I mean, that's pure conjecture, but maybe that was some of it as he saw what maybe he saw some personality traits that he recognized from his deceased brother. Who knows? I'm wondering, too. So they were in England and I want to say, what year was it? It was early 1500s, I want to say, if not maybe the late 1400s. No, it was like 1505 or it 1504, was. I want to say. It was shortly, I think it was shortly after Isabella's death. Okay. Do you have any ideas, as far as a timeline goes, after they left England and they went so that she could take her throne, so to speak, yeah. how long after that was it that they started saying she was mad? Oh, they had started doing that before then. So what's very curious, or in my opinion, what's very curious is Philip was going behind her back with her father, Ferdinand. And you even see a little bit of this in when they have their little jaunt to England. There's a treaty that was signed at Windsor and there are two copies of it, I believe. One of them is signed by both Philip and Juana. And there's another one that is slightly different that's signed only by Philip. What's your take on the whole thing? 
I think that Ferdinand, the whole thing overall or that specific incident? I'd say the whole the whole thing about her being quote unquote mad. I don't think she was. I think she had a lot of emotional ups and downs because of her pregnancies and childbirth. And as you know, I've never been pregnant and that might not, I've got some medical stuff, so I might not be able to do that. But from what I've seen from my friends and what they've told me, that's a very, very emotional time for multiple reasons. And then you have, as we mentioned before, Philip going around behind her back and having mistresses, which while that was perhaps common behavior, Juana, who is a queen in her own right or was going to be a queen in her own right, certainly didn't appreciate that. And when we get to Juana's arrival in Spain, so you have Juana and Philip and Ferdinand, and they're all in Spain, you see this series of documents of secret treaties between Philip and Ferdinand where they're saying things like, oh, Juana has these illnesses that for the sake of common decency, we're not going to write down what they are. (laughs) And if she's ever found to be unable to, it it doesn't even say she's found to be unable to rule. It's, they more portrayed it as her being disinterested in ruling. So this came back to that kind of male dominant concept, I guess you could say, and Philip being Philip's children being his children instead of being their children. But there are a series of treaties between Ferdinand and Philip where they either went behind behind Juana's back to sign them, or they say things in there just making it seem like she didn't want to rule. And on the few occasions that they did provide documents to her that they wanted her to sign, she refused to sign them. And then Ferdinand, who was excellent at propaganda, and in fact, that's part of the reason why he and his wife Isabella were able to take Castile and Leon from Isabella's, I believe it was actually her aunt, um, the original Juana of Castile, is because of a propaganda blitz, if you will, but Ferdinand was able to say, hey, Juana is not signing these documents, so clearly that must mean that she's mentally ill. And the other thing we have to keep in mind is that when after her husband dies, Juana is now effectively a single mother. And I know that that's kind of a strange context to place her in because we just don't really think about that. But she's a single mother. She's a widow. She's queen in her own right of Castile and Leon knows that her father and her deceased husband were doing something weird behind her back. And she's also pregnant with her sixth child. So in late 1506, I believe it was November of 1506, was the first attempt at Juana being removed as queen or some sort of action taken by the Aragonese nobles to invalidate her rule and what i what i'm getting at or what i'm trying to say is there is the cortez or the court in aragon and they can only be called by royal decree but they met without being called by juana or excuse me that might have been in castile actually so she didn't call them they gathered anyway and decided that ferdinand should be juana's guardian without talking to her. The other thing that was curious was in the first half of 1507, while Ferdinand was still away, and I don't remember off the top of my head where he was, but we have to keep in mind that the late medieval period, because Juana is considered a medieval queen, I know that depending on where you are in Europe, this is the Renaissance period or the early modern period, but Juana is usually considered a medieval queen. There, people were very suspicious. And so if you had issues with plague or disease or famine or whatever, then it was some, there was something wrong in the country that needed to be fixed. We even see this with Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. I think Anne Boleyn was blamed for a famine or something like that. But there is an outbreak of plague in Spain and a famine at the same time, the first half of 1507. And some reports state that as many as half the population of Spain died. And this is right after Juana becomes queen. And then curiously, when Ferdinand excuse me, re-enters his territories, the famine and the disease, or at least the disease, started to abate. And so it looked like by him returning that there was some sort of divine favor there. Do you see what I'm saying? Hmm. Her whole life, <laughs> to me, is a, it's, it's such a sad story. And when Philip died, you know, we hear the story of her carrying or bring his body along with her wherever she went, which clearly makes her look kind of mad at the time. (laughs) Was that real? Did she really take his body with her, his coffin or whatever it may be? 
My understanding, because I've not heavily researched this, because as we talked about, I'm more looking into Catherine of Aragon for uh, my book that should be, I think it'll be released in 2023 or maybe early 2024. But there was a letter written by or written to Devere, Devere, I'm not sure how to say his name, and allegedly signed by Juana. But if you look at the signature, it's actually completely different from any of her other known signatures, where which was used to base most of the allegations of her madness. It was used as a basis for most of the allegations of her madness. And again, I'm going to compare her to Anna of Cleves because that's my favorite queen right now. Um, it's like when we look at the documents that were the foundation for Henry and Anna of Cleves' relationship. Those were all created for political purpose to secure an annulment. This alleged letter that Juana wrote to Devere that is has a very strange signature on it is the basis for Juana's madness. And I do not know if that letter contains a description of her manhandling her husband's corpse or any of that strange, those strange details that we heard. I can say that she did at one point order his corpse moved from the monastery where she was staying. I can't remember if it was a monastery or not, but some sort of religious house and had him moved, had his body moved, I believe in 1507 to where it is now or where it wound up being. But I don't know that there's very many overt reports or accurate reports or reliable reports to show that she was indeed mad versus being a teenager married to a guy who was maybe emotionally abusive, or at least the two of them really like to scream at each other sometimes. Plus she's pregnant for half of her marriage, <laughs> more than half her marriage. <laughs> and then her dad's trying to take everything away from her. I don't know that she was mad. Now, the sad thing was after she... I, I believe it was after 1507. That was the last time she signed anything herself was in 1507. And then eventually her son, who became the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, winds up becoming Charles I of Spain. And that was in around 1517, I want to say. And he made no attempt to restore his mother, Juana, to the throne of Castile and Leon. So she was this vague political figure in the background that didn't actually do anything. But um, And then, of course, Charles later becomes Holy Roman Emperor. There's a revolt of the Camineros in 1520 to 1521. And there was a brief period of time where the rebels were trying to court Juana and say, hey, we'll bring you back into power if you can do this and we can undo some of Charles's power. But Juana was unwilling to do anything malicious towards her child. But unfortunately, she then was kept imprisoned until her death in, I believe it was 1555 when she was 75 years old. And during her imprisonment, Charles forbade anyone talking to her because he thought it would make her more crazy. And by this point, she could have gone mad. Who knows? She could have been horribly depressed. It's known that she was paranoid and that she thought that the nuns that were that lived in the convent where she was placed were going to murder her. I don't know how unrealistic that was for someone who had everything stolen from them and who was just shut up or walled away somewhere. But it seems that any quote unquote madness that she suffered was more from the impact of the actions of the, the three of the most important men in her life, her father, her husband, and then her eldest son. You know, I can't help but think how parallel the lives lives of both Juana and Catherine were, you know, being that Catherine had this husband who tried to get rid of her and shipped her off and sent her to these inhospitable castles and stuff. And in the same time, Juana is dealing with similar things. And it seems so odd to me that these two women who were daughters of Isabel of Castile ended up with lives like this. Yeah, and I think that's why Catherine was so indignant about having her marriage annulled and getting schlepped off to or shipped off to a convent. I think her by that time, her sister Juana had already been holed up in a convent for at least a decade, if not coming up on two by the time Henry and Catherine's marriage was annulled. So if I'm Catherine of Aragon and I know what the heck happened to my sister, I sure as heck don't want that to happen to me or happen to my daughter. Yeah, it all kind of makes more sense now that you know more of the story. Yeah. Now, you had mentioned Charles V was the child of Juana and Philip. Of their other children, are there notable names in there that we should know? In my opinion, there are, but you know how much I like to look at German and uh, 
the history of Germany and the Holy Roman Empire. So they had six children together that we know of, and they all lived to adulthood. There was Eleanor, who first, or Leonor, I believe. Um, she first married the king of Portugal and had a child with him. And then after his death, she wound up marrying Francis I of France as part of a political alliance that had something to do with Charles V defeating Francis at the Battle of Pavia and then their back and forth, so on and so forth. Um, she did not have a good marriage with Francis, but she did. A, they publicly respected each other at state events, but otherwise he didn't care very much for her and had no problems flaunting his mistress, and neither one of them had children. Then, of course, we have Philip, uh, excuse me, Charles V. He married his cousin Isabella of Portugal. That was another double wedding his youngest sister or Juana's youngest child Catherine married the prince of Portugal who was the brother of Isabella of Portugal which is the woman whom Charles V married Charles V and Isabella of Portugal had Philip II I think they might have had some other children but I have to be honest I'm not I didn't really pay much attention um, but his only wife was Isabella so after Isabella died which is of course when the marriage negotiations are happening for Henry VIII and Anna of Cleves. He goes into mourning and isolates himself for months and never remarries after he comes back out and, and only wears black for the rest of his life. And then you have, I believe Isabella was the third child. She's also sometimes called Elizabeth. She married the King of Denmark and her most famous child is Christina of Denmark. So she did have a son and two daughters. Her other daughter, Dorothea of Denmark, was the, she wound up marrying the Count of the Palatine. I think that's how you say it in English. <laughs> um, and Dorothea spent the rest of her life trying to regain the throne of Denmark because, of course, usurpers came in and kicked out Isabella and Isabella's husband and their children, Dorothea and Christina and the son. I don't remember the son's name, but Isabella died um, in the Low Countries. They fled to the Low Countries because it, by this point, I believe Margaret of Austria Juana's sister-in-law was the regent of the Netherlands. So they took shelter there and that's where Isabella died. And then you have, so that's what, that's three of them. And then Maria, Maria winds up being raised predominantly in Austria and she marries the King of Hungary. They had a very, very happy marriage. Unfortunately, he dies at the battle of Mohawks and she is, finds herself widowed and she winds up being appointed the regent of the Netherlands after her aunt, Margaret passes away and she's appointed by Charles V. What's, I don't know if this is interesting or not, but it's another case of a double marriage. So Maria weds Louis or Louis, I, I think his name was actually Laszlo in Hungarian, of Hungary. And then we see her, their younger brother, Ferdinand, who also wound up becoming a Holy Roman Emperor after Charles dies, marries Laszlo's sister, Anne of Bohemia. So there's another double marriage there. And then Ferdinand and Anne of Bohemia are tremendously fertile. I think they might have had, they might have had upwards of like 17 kids, but it was definitely in the double digits. I feel very comfortable saying 11, but it might have been a lot more than that. Wow. And uh, Wilhelm of Cleves actually winds up marrying one of their daughters, but that's how a lot of those connections were made in the late 16th to early 17th century. And then Catherine was perhaps the, the least publicized of the children, I guess you could say. She led the quietest life, but she became queen of Portugal. And she, unfortunately, all of her children died So there, before she did. So she outlived all of her children. And there are no living heirs of her body or from her direct bloodline. And she was a patron of the arts and just kind of quietly lived in Portugal and was a queen and did a good job and was very far removed from a lot of the family drama. I'm going to put you on the spot right now. Do it. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you, we talk about often the rulers in Europe. And I think for myself, that's where I begin to get confused on where everybody, how everybody is connected to one another, because you can say, you know, the regent of this and I have no idea who you're talking about until I can see a family tree and then it comes together for me. So I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you if you can help me put together a tree so that we can understand how they're all connected. I can. Who do you want me to start with? <laughs> I thought you were going to say, I can't. 
Um, I, you know, that's, that's a great idea. We'll talk about this after the show. And then I think this would be a nice little gift to my patrons as well. Well, I happen to have some of those already drawn up because I'm using them for books that I'm writing. So I would be happy to draw up one. Oh, nice. Okay. We'll talk more about that. And then if you're a patron, just keep your eyes peeled for some information. Heather, I want you to leave the listeners with what it is about Juana of Castile that intrigues you the most. I think she got a bad rap. I just, you know, I look at these women and I look at, and by these women, again, I'm thinking of Juana, I'm thinking of Anna of Cleves, I'm thinking of Catherine of Aragon, I'm thinking to an extent of Anne Boleyn, I'm thinking of Mary the I and Elizabeth the I. And you have these women who are in these powerful positions and history is written by the victors and history is written by the people who want to influence what actually happened or influence the historical record. And so when we look at the historical record and we start to pick apart the politics and what the goals were or what the goals appeared to be of the people who were writing these documents or who were signing these documents or creating these documents and the timing of these documents, because everything's paperwork for us from the 16th century. Of course, there's, there's portraiture and such, but overall, we only have paperwork to rely upon. So we have to read between the lines. We have to look at context, see what, what's important. But it is so difficult to understand what these women were really like or what was really happening in their lives if we take written record at face value. And that's what I think about. Well, what a wonderful note to leave that on. Heather, thank you so much for being on it again today. This is, I don't know, your fifth time on <laughs> It's, it's all right. I've got a lot to say, unfortunately. I hope people aren't getting tired of me. <laughs> well, I would just like um, to make one last statement for myself. This may be the first episode in a lot of episodes where I did not find a way to bring up Thomas Seymour. Oh, my God. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm I, sure. I, however, failed to not bring up Anna of Cleves. <laughs> so I cannot get away from her. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. We're, we're passionate. I had somebody um, on social media say, media say something about uh, my crush on Thomas Seymour. And I always say, I don't necessarily see it as a crush. Like, I don't want to date him. But <laughs> I, 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 have, I have an unhealthy obsession with him is maybe the way that I would describe it. Well, I think for me, too, when I look at Charles V, I learned the most about him by researching his interactions with Anna of Cleves family and brother and like Maximilian I, Charles grandfather and Philip the Fair Handsome's father was good buddies with both of Anna of Cleves grandfathers. And so I think that's why I wind up mentioning her. And also I'm finishing my second book about her family. So she's very much still in the forefront of my mind. But Yeah, it's all interesting, the lenses through which we see history, isn't it? Most definitely. Heather, where can everybody find you in your book? You can find me at maidensandmanuscripts.com. That's my blog. Otherwise, I am on Facebook, Heather R. Darcy Historian. I'm on Twitter. My handle there is at HR Darcy History. I'm also on Instagram. It's at H Darcy History. I, for some reason, did not include the R on Instagram because I don't know how to technology. But that's where you can find me. Um, my book, Anna, Duchess of Cleves, The King's Beloved Sister, is available in both the United Kingdom and the U.S. as paperback, hardback, and Kindle. And you can pick that up at Amazon.com or .co.uk or your favorite bookseller. I believe that both Waterstones and Foils in the UK, as well as Barnes and Noble in the US are carrying copies of it. And you offered up a copy to give away, did you not? I did, yes. So I believe I have a paperback copy. As you know, my birthday's coming up in a couple months, and I like to give away things to people for my birthday to help celebrate. So yes, I can... uh, Yay. Yeah, we can do that and maybe the drawn out family trees. Yeah, I think that would be great. We'll And we'll do that giveaway on social media since um, our Ask the Expert guest, Tony Riches, is giving all of my patrons a book this time. Yay. Heather, thank you, thank you so much again for being on. Yeah, anytime. Take care. And now, Ask the Expert. Today we're honored to have Brandon Trilogy author Tony Riches on the show to answer your questions about Charles Brandon, First Duke of Suffolk. Let's start at the beginning. Our first question is from Elena. 
And she would like to know, how did Charles Brandon become friends with Henry VIII? It's, it's quite an interesting story, this, is that um, Charles's father, Sir William Brandon, was Henry Tudor's standard bearer at the Battle of Bosworth. And rather sadly for him, he decided to hang on to the standard rather than defend himself and got cut down. He was one of the few people that might have actually been killed by Richard III. And um, Henry VII felt a bit bad about that and gave young Charles a job in his household, uh, serving at tables, really. So it wasn't the grandest of jobs. But Charles was quite a gifted horseman and uh, took up jousting. And young Henry VIII... Uh, was was basically wrapped in cotton wool. He wasn't allowed to do anything dangerous. His father kept him shut away and uh, was really worried. After what had happened to his brother, Henry's brother, then um, inevitably uh, the two of them got together, although there was an age difference of nine years or so, that Charles secretly taught Henry how to joust. And um, they became lifelong friends. And in fact... Um, at Charles Brandon's funeral, Henry said um, that nobody else had ever um, been so strong a friend to him. And when you think about it, you try and name the people that were lifelong friends of Henry VIII. It's a pretty short list, actually. We actually received tons of questions about Charles's relationship with Mary Tudor, Henry yeah, VIII. Yeah, I should imagine. Yeah. Yes. So for all our, all our listeners including Amanda Richardson, Diane Powhall, Allie, Jersey Cyclist, and actually four or five others. Can you describe for us the background of his marriage to Mary? Was he in love with her? Was it a status kind of a thing? And after literally risking his head, how did he bounce back <laughs> from that fallout with Henry? There are, there are lots of theories, but if there's, there's a couple of things that you have to do. The first is to put to one side your modern day views of what's right and wrong with marriage and things like that, because um, Henry VIII thought it was perfectly reasonable to marry his youngest sister to the 52 year old King Louis of France because of the um, deals that could be done, the, the treaties that would be signed. And for her part, Mary um, wasn't at all surprised. In fact, um, she quite liked the idea of being Queen of France and the fact that King Louis wasn't going to last very long was probably on her mind because he was pretty much on his deathbed. He'd had a pretty hard life. So the story is that she extracted from Henry a promise that if she married King Louis in good faith and didn't make a fuss, then she'd be allowed to have her own choice of partner if he died. And it said that Henry wasn't really that bothered. He, he quite happily allowed it. Uh, meanwhile, we have to remember that Brandon was around the whole time that Mary Tudor was growing up. So he would have seen her grow from a toddler to a quite attractive young woman. And by the time she was 18, um, his previous wife had died and he was a, a widower. And uh, it was started off, I believe, as a, a great opportunity. There's only one snag, is that Henry sent him across to France after King, France, king uh, Louis died to stop the French king, uh, the new French king, Francis I, from marrying her off to any of his pals. And one of the conditions was, on no account, was Brandon to marry Mary himself. And he did understand that. But when he saw her, um, I do, do believe that uh, he fell for her big time and decided that his friendship with the king was strong enough that it was worth the risk. It was a big risk because he could have had he could have been executed or put in the tower or accused of treason. And um, instead, a deal was done that Mary had inherited the crown jewels of France and uh, Henry VIII decided that he would like to have those for himself. So 
in return for everything they owned, this is Brandon and Mary now, pretty much apart from the clothes they stood up in, uh, they were allowed to get away with it. And um, it was a high risk strategy. So uh, when I decided to write about it on the balance of probabilities, I decided that it wasn't just a marriage of convenience. Mary Tudor could have married anybody she wanted to. And uh, Brandon himself as uh, was quite a catch, really. So I, I do believe that they fell in love. And the evidence of their marriage afterwards um, supports that theory. We all like to believe in a love story, right? And because Mary was a tutor and they did have sons, Doug Breeden would like to know if they would have been considered successors of Edward VI before Jane Grey or even before Mary. Yes, and that would have saved a lot of trouble. And it's interesting to note that um, after Brandon married Catherine Willoughby, um, their sons were then educated with Edward and being groomed as possible um, successors to the line. So um, history could have been quite different. And speaking of his marriage then to Catherine Willoughby, Jessica Smith would like to know if that also was a love match or if you think that was more of a business opportunity for him since he was so much older than her and since she had been living in his house for so long. Do you think that, well, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> Do you think that that was yeah, um, um, a successful relationship as well? It certainly didn't start as a love match because uh, of the age difference apart from anything else. And uh, she was his ward and was destined to marry his son. So um, he did wait a whole three months before marrying her, and by that time she was actually 14. So the the age difference, which seems quite shocking these days, uh, wasn't that exceptional for Tudor times. And I believe that, as with Mary, they may have originally got together um, if we remember that Catherine Willoughby was one of the wealthiest landowners in Lincolnshire through her inheritance, and combining that with Charles Brandon's estates, it made them jointly extremely powerful in the north. So um, it was, on the one hand, a, a very convenient marriage, but on the other hand, um, looking at their letters and the way that they lived their lives, I think they, they quite quickly grew to love each other. So once again, I think we have another love story from circumstance. Since we're talking about his love life, um, because that's what we all want to continue to discuss, of course, can you give us the lowdown on the list of his children, both legitimate and illegitimate? We've got a lot of questions from some different listeners, but Vicki Ellis in particular, would like to know if he was actually as much of a ladies' man as he's made out to be. Yeah, this is, once again, uh, the the television versions of the story, of Charles Brandon's story, don't do him a lot of favours because um, he does come across as something of a what that might be referred to as a womanizer. But we also have to remember that in Tudor times, illegitimate children weren't that exceptional. And, um, you know, Henry VIII, himself set set uh, the bar quite high but it's, it's a little bit complicated if we go back to the beginning Charles Brandon was I think in love with a girl called Anne Brown who thought he was going to marry her and then he promptly married her aunt Margaret Neville when he was uh, 22 and she would have been about 43 and that was a marriage of convenience in that he promptly started selling off her lands the, and then when he'd got as much as he could out of it, um, the marriage was dissolved and he actually married Anne Brown, who gave him two daughters, Anne and Mary, before she died. So he ended up as a, a young widower with two young daughters. And then he contracted to marry um, an eight-year-old lady called Elizabeth Grey, who was Baroness Leal. And what he got out of that was uh, the title of Viscount Leal. And so, once again, that was very much more about convenience. I don't believe he ever intended to marry Elizabeth Grey. And um, it was the kind of thing that happened in those days. So it was 
once he married Mary Tudor, that it gets really quite complicated because uh, their their first son, who was born in 1516, was named Henry after the king. So he's Henry Brandon. And then, sadly, uh, he died in 1522. So you have to sort of put that to one side. And then he had Francis in 1517, his daughter Francis, who married Henry Grey. Um, and she was the mother of Lady Jane Grey, which is another connection, isn't it? And his other okay. daughter, Eleanor, was born in uh, 1519, who married another Henry, Henry Clifford, who was the Earl of Cumberland and quite a character. And then to make things quite complicated, their next son, uh, they called Henry again. They, they're very keen on. So people get very confused between the first Henry Brandon and the last Henry and Brandon, which is quite understandable. Right. The, the last Henry Brandon, who was born in 1523, became the Earl of Lincoln. But sadly, he then died in 1534. So the result of all of that is that he had uh, four daughters by two different wives. And um, then he married Catherine Willoughby, uh, as I said, three months after Mary Tudor died, because um, because he could, really. And the 35-year age gap didn't bother him at all. And uh, I think it, got, it, it, it reinforced his reputation at court. But even by Tudor standards, people were a little bit raising an eyebrow at the, the speed of it. And, of course, then we have the third Henry Brandon, who is the, daughter, the, the son of Catherine Willoughby, who became the second Duke of Suffolk. Uh, that was 1535. And, confusingly, uh, their second son was called Charles. So we got uh, another Charles Brandon, who would have been, the th in fact, he did become, very briefly, the third Duke of Suffolk. And sadly, both of those sons died um, of the sweating sickness, which is very poignant in the current situation, in uh, July 1551. And um, they were actually put in um, isolation to avoid what was basically the the pandemic that was uh, killing people right through the country. And uh, they both died within an hour or so of each other. Um, it's said that there are at least three um, named illegitimate children. And once again, it's it very confusing because the first illegitimate son we don't know who the mother was, but he was called Charles Brandon. He became a knight, so he was Sir Charles Brandon. And we, there's evidence that he married a lady called Elizabeth Piggott. And then there's an illegitimate daughter called Frances, not to be confused with the other Frances, and another illegitimate daughter called Mary. So uh, they recycled the same names all of the time. Now, I've done a lot of research to try and find out who the mothers were, of these people. I'm fairly confident that they existed, especially Charles Brandon, and also that it was no surprise to anybody. Um, but exactly which wife um, he was being unfaithful to is, is quite hard to tell, because it seems that the, the marriage with Catherine Willoughby was very sound, and as I said earlier, he was in love with Mary Tudor. So uh, we'll never know, I don't think, unless some new document comes to light. It'll be an interesting mystery. It is, but at least you know that they exist and you were able to answer all those questions. So thank you so much. Um, our next question was asked by several listeners, Orsolia Durai, Shane, Tift, and others would like for you to clarify Charles's stance on Henry VIII's relationship with Anne Boleyn. It's really quite complicated because... First of all, we have to remember he was Henry VIII's best friend and a confidant. And so it, he would have been more understanding than most people about um, Henry's uh, frustration at the, the the sad failure of Catherine of Aragon to provide him with a son. So he would have understood that because it was terribly important for the succession. But... Um, Charles Brandon's wife, Mary Tudor, 
was good friends with Catherine of Aragon and actually was one of the few people that dared to speak out against Anne Boleyn, which put Charles Brandon in an impossible position at court because what do you do when you're, you're, you're having to pitch your, your, your monarch and best friend against your wife? And um, quite dangerous and worrying time for him, I would have thought. Uh, then we have to remember that uh, Charles Brandon's last wife, Catherine Willoughby, was actually the daughter of Maria de Salinas, who was came to England as a 15-year-old with Catherine of Aragon from Spain and was Catherine of Aragon's lifelong companion. So um, it was made worse by the fact that Catherine of Aragon sadly died in January 1536, which was the year of Anne Boleyn's trial and I can just imagine, well I did imagine it because I put it in my book that uh, Brandon wasn't surprised to be chosen to be on the jury at her trial and he might have been surprised to realise that he had to ask the dreadful question, do you deny that you lay with your brother to conceive a son contrary to all human laws? And if that's not one of the worst questions at her trial, I don't know which was, really, apart from being accused of witchcraft. Right. And um, it, it, he must have gone through uh, quite a, an agony of conscience there. But he decided that he had no choice. He had to go through the motions. He had to ask the question. And whatever she said wasn't going to make any difference because they'd already made their mind up. And... Um, I just think it's, it's, it must have been an awful time for him, and he was jolly glad when it was all over. Thank you. Our last question comes from D. Withers, and he asks, what was Charles Brandon's role in the Pilgrimage of Grace? Well, that's an interesting one, because the, the, most people are probably familiar with the background to the Pilgrimage of Grace was that it was uh, Thomas Cromwell's looting of the monasteries, uh, extended to the parish churches where they would use it as an excuse to strip them of any assets and that was particularly going down badly in the north and because uh, Charles Brandon was effectively um, in in league with um, Thomas Howard the the two dukes were the guardians of the north then Charles Brandon got the rather unhappy job of assembling his followers, his retainers, which there's something like a thousand armed men, but they weren't really soldiers. They were a mixture of knights and uh, people from the fields that had been armed with swords and pikes and God knows what else. And they had to go to Lincoln where the rioters seemed to be assembling and uh, put an end to it all before it ended in tears. And a complicating factor was that one of the ringleaders was uh, William Willoughby, who was related um, to Catherine Willoughby in that uh, he was uh, her uncle, her uncle's son. I had to get this right. So William Willoughby was the son of uh, Catherine's uncle. And... When Brandon got to Lincoln with his um, small army, firstly, he found that he was pretty much outnumbered. And secondly, that the ringleader was, in fact, Sir John Hussey, who Brandon knew well. He was Baron of Sleaford and he'd been in Princess Mary's household as uh, her chamberlain. So um, they would have all known each other. And uh, he basically... Um, challenged uh, Sir John to say what you know what's your grievance what is it that you've got against the king and um, they denied that there was any rebellion but that they were simply um, had to put an end to the pillaging of the churches and um, what happened was that Charles Brandon managed to get them to all uh, put down their weapons and uh, go back home with the promise that he would have a word with the king. And what they actually did instead was uh, just reassembled in York. But this time it was Thomas Howard who was sent to deal with them. 
and he told them all that they could have a general pardon if they surrendered uh, and then he got accused of um, sympathising with the rebels so he um, arrested the ringleaders and did the, did the dirty work really so a rather long answer to a short question is that um, Charles Brandon did his duty he did his best to be even handed in that um, he listened to them he listened to their grievances he presented their grievances to the king he got them to end their rebellion at least for a while and um, probably breathed a big sigh of relief when Thomas Howard uh, finally sorted it out in a rather barbaric fashion I must admit well, thank you so much for your time, Tony. It's been so much fun chatting with you, and our listeners appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Is there anything that you want to tell us about how we can find you on social media, or if you want to let us know the names of your books so that we can all support you, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, it's been interesting, uh, some interesting questions, so thank you for those. Uh, it's It's such a fascinating period of history and um, it's been misrepresented by the, um, the various television programs over the years some of them are better than others but what people might like to do is to go back to the beginning of my Tudor trilogy which begins with Owen Tudor's first meeting with Queen Catherine of Valois the Dowager Queen so that's when the Tudors first started and then those three books take it up to the end of the reign of Henry the Seventh, and introduces Henry the Eighth as a as a eighteen year old. And then the Brandon trilogy continues the story from Mary Tudor's point of view. This is Mary Tudor, Queen of France. She liked using that title right up to her death. And that wasn't going to be a trilogy. That was just going to be a a sequel to the Tudor trilogy but then I realized it'd be quite interesting to tell the same story from Charles Brandon's point of view because he had a very different point of view on it all to um, Mary and then that allowed me then to introduce this fascinating woman who was way ahead of her time Catherine Willoughby who was could have been uh, the seventh wife of Henry VIII so that's an interesting thing to consider uh, she turned him down because she was in love with somebody else but uh, not many people had the nerve to do that I don't think he was at the end of his his life I suppose sure but, turning him down is a brave move <laughs> I, know. I enjoyed writing that scene in the in the book but um, everything I've talked about this 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 in this chat is covered in those books and when I finished the 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 last book of the Brandon trilogy which was about Catherine Willoughby um, I realized that I'd introduced the reign of a lady called Elizabeth I so I'm now working on Elizabethan series and um, rather than actually write it from Elizabeth's point of view I'm choosing to write it through the point of view of her favorites so I've written uh, the first book of that is about Drake Francis Drake and most of what people know about Francis Drake I found was actually wrong and then the second book in that series which is with my editor now is about Robert Devereux Earl of Essex um, who who had the nerve to rebel against uh, Elizabeth I and then the third book is about uh, Walter Raleigh so taken together three very different views of um, Elizabeth and they take it right to the end of the Tudor dynasty so my the, the total nine books will span the entire Tudor reign from the very first moment right through to the end and if anybody's interested in looking at that, all the details are on my website which is tonyriches.com and you're welcome to follow me on Twitter at Tony Riches and uh, I'm on Facebook and um, Instagram as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, and congratulations. That sounds really exciting to read, and that's a really creative way of telling all those stories. So thank you. We're looking forward to those. Yeah, I'd be happy to come back sometime and talk about the Elizabethan period because I think the more research I do, the more I realize how it's been misrepresented 
and um, Elizabeth is uh, is now emerging. People are understanding that she was a much cleverer, more complex woman than the sort of um, caricature we often get presented with on the television or on, on films. Thank you so much, Tony. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. And now, a brief history. In the 16th century, there were very few protections for women. Husbands were believed to have godly authority to correct their wives the way children's behavior was corrected. A 1630 legal treatise on the rights of women laid it out. There is some kind of castigation which law permits a husband to use. He shall neither do, nor procure to be done to her, any bodily damage, otherwise than appertains to the office of a husband for lawful and reasonable correction. In other words, as long as a man's violence didn't actually injure the woman to the point of death, it was considered an ordinary aspect of marriage. As a result, we have few domestic violence cases on record. Some scholars argue that the lack of recorded cases signifies that domestic violence was so normalized and pervasive that it wasn't thought to be a social problem in the era. But what could a woman do if she felt her husband had gone too far and endangered her life? In the case of the two noble ladies we'll discuss in this segment, they appealed to Cromwell, who had the ear of the king, the highest source of justice in the land. Elizabeth Stafford was born in 1497, the daughter of the Duke of Buckingham. As a child, she was engaged to a boy named Ralph Neville, later Earl of Westmoreland. The two young people fell in love and seemed destined for a joyful future, a rare love match. When Elizabeth was 16, she caught the eye of the then Earl of Surrey, Thomas Howard, who later became the third Duke of Norfolk, a man nearly 20 years her senior, and he asked her father for her hand in marriage. Buckingham tried to dissuade Thomas Howard and offered one of his other daughters instead, but Howard wanted Elizabeth. Now, Buckingham didn't really have a reason to refuse him, and so Elizabeth's betrothal to Neville was severed, and she had to wed Howard. The marriage produced five children, and Elizabeth appears to have been a dutiful wife, at least until Thomas Howard decided he wanted to put her aside. In 1527, the then Duke of Norfolk decided he wanted an annulment so he could marry his mistress, Bess Holland. Elizabeth refused on general principle, much like Catherine of Aragon. Now, she was Norfolk's legal and true wife and wasn't about to step aside for a woman she considered a low-born harlot. As Elizabeth said in her response, I will never dissolve the marriage during my life, for no ill handling that he can do to me, nor for no imprisonment. I will not do it at the king's commandment, nor at your desire. I will not do it for no friend, nor kin I have living. During the Tudor era, women rarely advocated for themselves when there were marital problems. The woman's father was usually the one to answer for her, but Elizabeth's father had been executed for treason in 1521, so the next male relative, such as a brother or son, should have taken on this duty. But as we will see, Elizabeth's brother and son were both unwilling. Elizabeth claimed that since Norfolk fell in love with Bess Holland, which was four years previously, that she had been imprisoned. He seized her clothing and her jewels and locked her in a chamber. Since that day, she was not allowed to, quote, come abroad and see my friends, nor was anyone permitted to visit her, quote, but such as he appointeth. Legally, there wasn't any problem with Norfolk taking away his wife's valuables or locking her away. Everything a woman owned was property of her husband, and if he wanted to take it from her, that was his prerogative. He could also hold her captive because it was his decision how and where she would reside and whether she would be allowed to speak to others. This applied universally, from the highest-ranking women to the lowest. When Henry VIII sought to end his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, he essentially kept her captive by ordering her to stay at a distant, infrequently used manner and refusing permission for her to communicate with the outside world. He seized her jewels and gave them to Anne Boleyn. Catherine had no choice but to obey the man she considered her husband, 
even when he forbid her from seeing her beloved daughter. Even a queen was just a woman, and under the power of her husband. However, the allegations Elizabeth made against Norfolk didn't stop at mere captivity. The first mention we have of abuse is in an indignant letter from Norfolk to Cromwell, informing him that his willful wife had come to London, but he refused to see her until she confessed that she had slandered him. Norfolk said Elizabeth was claiming that 20 years prior that he had physically abused her by dragging her out of her bed by her hair and slicing her with a knife while she was giving birth. Elizabeth intended to show a scar as proof of this abuse, but Norfolk claimed that she had acquired it when a doctor lanced her for an infection after she had had two teeth removed. He wrote that he didn't believe any man living would treat a woman in childbed like that. From Elizabeth herself, we have 12 extant letters. In none of them does she mention the story Norfolk told Cromwell. But three times, Elizabeth wrote that Norfolk's female servants had beaten her at Bess Holland's command, tying Elizabeth up and abusing her until she spit blood. The beating had been so severe, she had never fully recovered her health. In 1536, Nine years after her husband first decided he wanted to put her aside, Elizabeth heard that the king was at Dunstable for his honeymoon with Jane Seymour and decided to try and plead her case personally. She managed to slip away from the house and rode to meet him. Now, the king was apparently somewhat impatient and ordered her to write gently to Norfolk, to whom she owed her obedience and docility. All this as he sat beside his third wife. Henry was preaching to Elizabeth about the sanctity of marriage. Norfolk wrote to Cromwell in 1538. If she continue in her most false and abominable lies and obstinacy against me. If God bring me home again, I shall not fail, unless the king's highness command me the contrary to lock her up. She was already forbidden to travel or have visitors. Norfolk was threatening to keep Elizabeth from being able to contact the outside world. Elizabeth pleaded with Cromwell for help. She was willing to reconcile with her husband, though she said she knew if he took her back it would only be because of public uproar. She would have to endure worse treatment, and it would be hard to get used to brawling and fighting. But her husband refused to reconcile unless she publicly recanted the stories of abuse. Cromwell appears to have tried to negotiate some sort of financial settlement for Elizabeth, but she complained she couldn't live on what her husband was paying. You promised three and a half years ago to put me to a better living, and I am sure that if I had had friends to remind you, I should have had it ere this. I am a gentlewoman, born and brought up daintily and not on fifty pounds a quarter. He appears to have focused his efforts on getting one of Elizabeth's family to take her in. Everyone refused. It's hard for us to imagine today that a family might be more horrified that Elizabeth had spoken publicly of the abuse than they were at the idea that Elizabeth endured it. Few of her friends were sympathetic, and her brother wrote, The pitiful exclamation of her poor friends, praying her to remember what honor she has come to by her husband. Apparently, Elizabeth's friends stopped sending her gifts, which she attributed to them being afraid of her husband's displeasure. Interestingly enough, it seems the only person who spoke up on Elizabeth's behalf was Ralph Neville, the boy to whom she had been engaged to decades ago. Elizabeth's brother, Lord Henry Stafford, flatly refused to get involved when he wrote, But since, in spite of all these things, and the gentleness of her husband, she cannot be induced to break her sensual and willful mind. I should incur great jeopardy from her wild language. It is my shame and sorrow, being her brother, to have to rehearse all this. Elizabeth's children also rejected their mother and sided with their father. From a practical standpoint, both were still financially reliant on his good graces. But the more likely reason is that Elizabeth had made herself socially unacceptable. With her, quote, wild and willful ways. It seems to have hurt her deeply. She wrote, 
I may say, I was born in an unhappy hour to be matched with such an ungracious husband and so ungracious a son and daughter. Elizabeth wasn't released from her misery until her husband was arrested and convicted of treason in 1547. A full 20 years after Norfolk first decided he wanted to marry Bess Holland. Her clothing and jewelry were finally returned to her, but she had to sell it all because of all the debts that she had accumulated in the meantime. Norfolk escaped the axe, but died a year later. He left his wife no bequests in his will. The second story we'll look at is that of Elizabeth Hussey, Lady Hungerford. She was born around 1506, the daughter of a baron who was a chamberlain for Princess Mary. Elizabeth was wed in 1532 to a man named Walter, Baron Hungerford. Shortly after the wedding, Elizabeth's father arranged an introduction for Walter to Cromwell and successfully applied to have him given important positions. Walter seems to have been eager to cultivate this relationship with Cromwell. The letters and papers contain at least a dozen letters he wrote thanking Cromwell for his various favors, including granting him the office of sheriff. Walter had been married and widowed twice before he wed Elizabeth, and she later wrote that Walter's cruelty to his wives was well known. One wonders if Elizabeth's father knew about it and maybe shrugged it off as exaggeration. Or maybe he thought it was unimportant when compared to the advantages the men would gain from the match. For several years, all was quiet. The couple had no children, but Walter had already obtained his heir in a spare from his previous wives. In 1535, there was a mention of Walter in Cromwell's notes that Cromwell needed to remember to reward Walter for his, quote, well-doing. A year later, Walter was summoned to Parliament as Lord Hungerford of Hatesbury. Elizabeth's father was caught up in the rebellion known as the Pilgrimage of Grace. He didn't combat the rebels to the king's satisfaction, and so he was charged with treason and executed in 1537. The family lost everything. All their wealth, titles, and estates were forfeit to the king. Though it can't be said for certain that the loss of his inheritance and birthright was the reason for it, the abuse Elizabeth endured appears to have begun in earnest around the time of her value as a spouse plummeting. Walter seems to have decided that it was time to rid himself of her one way or another. Sometime around the end of 1539, Cromwell received a letter from Elizabeth. She wrote that her husband had kept her locked in a tower of Farley Castle. She wrote that her husband had kept her locked in a tower of Farley Castle for the last three or four years and was starving her. The fact that she couldn't even tell if it had been three years or four years is chilling and says a great deal about the horrors of her captivity. Walter asked for a divorce from Elizabeth, claiming she'd committed adultery. Unlike the other Elizabeth we discussed, this Elizabeth was willing for her marriage to end, but asked that it be for a more honorable reason. Elizabeth said in her letter that she could prove certain accusations against Walter, which she described as detestable, and he knew it. She may have been hinting at the secret which eventually got Walter killed. Walter's chaplain functioned as her jailer. She said the chaplain told her that he intended to save Walter from the burden of having to pay for her support. She believed he openly admitted he had twice tried to poison her, so she was afraid to eat any food that he brought her. At times, she even drank her own urine rather than perish from thirst. It's entirely possible that the chaplain wasn't actually tampering with the food, but terrorizing Elizabeth and forcing her to starve herself really accomplished the same goal. Fortunately, the people of the village had learned of her plight and smuggled food and drink to her through a window. The letter to Cromwell was likely smuggled out by the same means. The people helped her for charity's sake alone because she had no money to pay them. She said they risked helping her because they knew of Walter's, quote, demeanor always to his wives. Whatever Walter did to the women in his life, it stood out in an era which abuse of women was commonplace. Elizabeth asked Cromwell to order her husband to release her, 
She didn't think she would survive much longer, but she'd be better off committing suicide than living like this. She pleaded to be allowed to walk to London and speak with Cromwell personally and offered to beg for her living from door to door if she could just have her freedom. When Cromwell received this heartfelt plea, he did absolutely nothing. We don't even know if he spoke to Walter about the letter or asked him about the treatment of his wife. He did not order Walter to free her or agree to speak to Elizabeth personally and made no notes in his papers about the issue. From what we can determine, nothing changed. Walter continued to be in high favor at court. His close association with Cromwell, however, may have been his undoing. Cromwell was arrested for treason in the summer of 1540, and Walter himself was arrested soon after. He was charged with hiring a man who treasonously said how sorry he was to see that the king, quote, plucketh down the abbeys and images, and asked a conjurer to forecast how long the king would live. That last accusation in the indictment was damning for that era. Walter was charged with having sex with three men, which was a capital offense under Henry VIII's 1533 Buggery Act. This may have been the detestable accusations that Elizabeth alluded to in her letter. Walter was the first man prosecuted under the statute. He was executed the same day as Cromwell. Witnesses said that Walter appeared to be in a frenzy as he was dragged to the block. To the people of the Tudor era, this indicated consciousness of guilt. That Walter was unable to meet death calmly because he was afraid of the judgment of God. Both women took a bold and courageous step in reaching out for help and in attempting to advocate for themselves. Both were survivors in an era that put little value on women's lives. Both women survived their terrible marriages and seem to have thrived in the following years. Elizabeth, Duchess of Norfolk, returned to court to serve Queen Mary I. Elizabeth Hungerford, amazingly enough, chose to marry again six years later and had almost a dozen children. Thanks for checking out the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at TudorsDynasty.com. Follow Tudor's Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening.